Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm your guest host, Emmy Vadness, filling in for Jeffrey Mishlove. Our topic today is medical intuition. My guest is Wendy Coulter, who is author of Essentials of Medical Intuition, A Visionary Path to Wellness. Wendy is a certified medical intuitive, certified wellness coach, and the founder and CEO of The Practical Path. Wendy's research study, Assessing the Accuracy of Medical Intuition, a Subjective and Exploratory Study, was published in the Peer Review Journal of Alternative and Complementary Medicine. She provides medical intuitive training that helps wellness professionals develop and optimize their inherent intuition. Wendy is based in the Los Angeles, California area, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Wendy. It's such a pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you, Emmy. It's a pleasure to be here. Maybe we could start with sharing with the audience what is medical intuition, because I think some people might have their own ideas of what they think it is, and there might be some misconceptions out there. I think there's a lot of misconceptions out there on what medical intuition is, and I like to describe it by first talking about what it isn't. <laughs> what medical intuition isn't is a treatment, a modality, or a healing skill. It, what it is is an assessment skill. So it is an intuitive assessment skill to look at the physical body as well as the biofield to take a look and see where imbalances might be occurring and why. How does one become a medical intuitive? Well, one can study with me. <laughs> A lot of medical intuitives are self-taught uh, or they have been mentored. There's not a lot of places to study medical intuition. There are a few uh, in the country. I, I, my program certifies medical intuitives. And I, I work with healthcare professionals. Those are the people that come through my program. Uh, anyone in healthcare, uh, that is where I see medical intuition really being of the most value uh, in healthcare. Yeah. And how did you come into becoming a medical intuitive? Well, it's a long story, <laughs> but I was um, a very intuitive child from an early age, and I could always tell when somebody wasn't feeling you know, well, <laughs> although I couldn't have told you what that was about. Um, I did notice that I, I could perceive intuitively, uh, maybe more than my classmates <laughs> you know, could. And uh, later in life, I became an energy healer, um, and I did a lot of energy healing work, an energy healing practitioner, I should say. And uh, in my work, um, I noticed that I could see into the body. And when I was giving, uh, you know, doing my healing work, I could see not only into the physiology and the anatomy of the body, but I could also see the origins of the issue. And I found that really fascinating. And so what I ended up doing was giving an assessment to my clients on what I was seeing and where the imbalances were, just to see if that would be of use to them. And I found that that was of more use to them <laughs> in many ways than the actual healing work, uh, because uh, many um, people in the healing field and also in um, uh, in healthcare notice that sometimes people have trouble healing right? So when that happens, the question is why? <laughs> and I wanted to find out the why. So I didn't really know what to call this. I did read Carolyn Mace's book and I thought, oh, that's kind of what I'm doing here. <laughs> uh, her book, Anatomy of the Spirit. And I was curious more to learn more about this. That's how I developed this. And that's how I developed my program. And I realized that teaching healthcare providers was really uh, the, a the best way to shift the paradigm of uh, me mechanistic biomedicine that doesn't really take into account the mind, body, and spirit approach. Uh, many energy healers do use their intuition in order to provide energy healing. Many energy healers are tr trained to go ahead and just start channeling energy to the individual. However, the assessment part can be very important and I know for myself, working as an energy healer and intuitive myself, 
I began assessing the energy first before providing the energy healing. But what a curious thing happened, and I know you and I talked briefly about this before, is that when I started assessing people, I noticed that the healing already started beginning. Yes. Yes, it does. Information is power, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, Dean Ornish's quote is one of my favorite quotes. Awareness is the first step in healing. Uh, I found that with the information, people were able to release things that were stuck in their energy and their you know, biofield or in their bodies for years uh, with that kind of information about where the origins, the root causes really of these um, issues were, people could really let go of things. It was really quite extraordinary. Now, that's not the goal necessarily of medical intuition. The goal of healing work is that's that goal, right? But this goal is to assess it so people have more information about what is going on and where it came from and all of this. And I found over and over that people were able to really shift their focus. And uh, many, many, stu many clients, the feedback was pretty much unanimous that this was a really great turning point for them. More understanding uh, gives us more ability to release Right, because it seems that doing the medical intuitive assessment is receiving information and providing healing, perhaps, is sending what we might consider energy healing or uh, some type of light and love to the individual. That's a beautiful way to put it, Emmy. I, I appreciate that, and I agree with you. It's a different skill set. And the other thing I noticed was... Uh, what if my energy healing modality wasn't necessarily the best match for my client, <laughs> right? What could help them? That's what the body can let us know. So medical intuitives are having this intuitive conversation with the client's body and biofield to find out what could help in, this, in these circumstances. How do you think it works? How do you think you are receiving this information? Well, it's an intuition. It's an intuitive conversation. <laughs> so intuitively, uh, I like the, uh, there are many kinds of intuition. Uh, there's, uh, you know, feeling intuition, clairsentience, there's cognizance, claircognizance, knowing intuition, there's hearing intuition. I use the visual skill of uh, clairvoyance, it's called, uh, and meaning clear seeing, so that I can actually get a visual on the anatomy and the physiology of the body. Because without that, you know, what am I looking at? <laughs> I want to know how your kidneys are functioning, or I want to see how the liver is functioning. In these realms of intuition and energy healing, which there are many forms of energy healing, which I understand that medical intuition is not exactly the same, although intuition is being used in energy healing, that energy healing practitioners, whether it be Reiki or Qigong or those who are part of Healing Touch, which really is uh, was created by nurses and really, you know, is a combination of many different traditions over the millennia, that it's thought that there is a biofield that one is working with, reading, assessing, manipulating, or even channeling energy, light, certain frequencies. And at the same time, we are all part, perhaps, of the one consciousness. And that because this uh, medical intuition, for example, in your study, it's something that you, you can do distantly, remotely. You don't have to be right next to the person. And so it seems that that non-local consciousness is also at play. It's a very, very useful skill, if just for that. <laughs> um, medical intuition is done at a distance. I teach my programs online. Uh, we have people from all over the world and all over the country. And so this skill is designed to be remote. It is designed to be non-local, right? We don't need to be in the same room. Uh, and that is a wonderful feature of this ability. Um, and it gives us, th there's no limitation on it because of that. When reading your book, a story that stood out to me on how you, it seemed like it sort of helped to sort of seal your determination to help people with healing is the story of Annie. Could you just share a little bit about your experience with this individual? Working with this uh, young woman named Annie was a real turning point for my career. Uh, I began to understand the power and the use of this skill. So Annie was a uh, a uh, lovely young woman in her 20s uh, in Hollywood here, um, very vivacious young woman. And she had had um, 
severe pain in her upper kind of upper mid back and she'd been to specialist after specialist and nobody could find the cause of her pain and it was kind of in the kidney area this was i want to say almost 20 years ago now in one session within 5 minutes really of looking at her kidneys what i saw was a Oh, excuse me. Let me tell you what happened for Annie in the medical world <laughs> before I get there. What happened for Annie was because the doctors couldn't find the reason for her pain is they gave her um, opioids for, she was clearly in pain. They gave her opioids for the pain and they called it psychosomatic. So they gave her antidepressants. So she was on these two drugs to try to help mitigate her obvious symptoms, but they couldn't find a cause for them. So that's when uh, she called me and I took a look and within a very short period of time, I was able to see looking at her kidney that there was a little crystallization that had formed and had moved slightly out of the kidney and it embedded itself right at the top of the ureter tube, which goes down to the bladder. And I was looking at it and asked, having this conversation with her body and the conversation was, well, what can Annie do to get rid of this? <laughs> Does she need to drink three gallons of water? You know, what has to happen here? And her body, her kidney actually very clearly uh, gave me some instruction and that was to tell her to go see a surgeon that this was a job for a surgeon and I asked again same answer so what I did for Annie was I sketched out on a piece of paper her kidney and where I saw the little crystallization and I, I suggested strongly that she go find a specialist who is willing to listen I found out a couple of years later what happened um Annie had found a surgeon who was willing to take her case uh, and had diagnosed the kidney stone, which is what it was correctly. They had a, a, a surgery on it and she was out of pain. Now, this is a really important example because psychosomatic, what does that mean? You know, that's a, that's a loaded word. It means that whatever you're feeling or whatever you're experiencing may not be true according to, you know, Western medicine, whereas this was actually an issue for her. Now, what had happened for Annie, which is why this was such a powerful story, that alone is really great. What I realized or what I found out was that the testing at the time, that little kidney stone was too small to see with the testing 20 years ago. The testing has improved. So that's why the doctors couldn't find it, and that's why the surgeon was able to. Okay, so what happened for Annie was uh, by the time I heard about what happened for her, she had become very addicted to the opioids that they'd given her for pain, and she died of an overdose uh, from that medication. That is a terrible, tragic story, and that was why this particular um, case for me was such a wake-up call. I realized how important this skill is. Up until then, you know, some time ago, uh, you know, this was just this really kind of cool, interesting thing I could do. But that made me realize that this work can save lives. And that's really where it belongs. It belongs in the medical world, saving lives. And that's why I began um, my programs. That's why I teach healthcare professionals. And the results that we're seeing from this work in the clinical field is really quite wonderful. Well, that's a beautiful example of your skills with medical intuition. And unfortunately, she was, well, they didn't have the diagnostic capabilities. So what, and that's true for um, even currently some types of uh, brain injuries today. Some people are walking around with uh, status post-traumatic brain injuries from a bump on their head that they didn't realize was significant and it's impacting their lives, but it's not showing up on scans. You know, medicine and science uh, is always moving forward, right? It's not static. Uh, but people think about it that way. But um, medical intuitives are known for seeing things in, you know, the physiology or the anatomy or whatever that science hasn't actually caught up with, right? Uh, or let's look at this. Um, adverse childhood experiences, which is traumatic experiences from childhood that actually have health impacts later in life. Well, guess what? <laughs> Medical intuitism has been seeing those connections for millennia. And uh, I remember when those studies first came out uh, some time ago and all the books were being written about adverse childhood experiences and how later in life, you know, early trauma creates, you know, diabetes and heart disease and cancer even and all kinds of problems. 
physical problems. And I just went, ding, you know, okay, there it is. <laughs> Medical intuitives have been seeing this connection between the mind, the spirit, and the body forever. And now science is catching up. And that's exciting when that happens. It's also a little bit frustrating, <laughs> right? You know, I was seeing SIBO, which is, um, I believe it's a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, uh, which is a, a, a real concern for many people in, in terms of gut health. Uh, Western medicine didn't actually name it for quite a long time, but medical intuitives were seeing it. I was seeing it, you know, almost 20 years ago. It's like, well, I see this. What can, what can work here? <laughs> you know? um, so we have to understand that medical intuition is not only valuable for in the moment understanding what's going on, but also for the future, you know, research. Uh, in fact, uh, I've been talking with some wonderful researchers about the idea of doing studies with medical intuitives on long COVID, uh, because there's so many symptoms that come with that issue. What can we see? How can we help? Right? There's a lot of opportunity. You mentioned trauma. And when assessing the mind, the body and spirit as a medical intuitive, could you kind of walk us through how you are perceiving what you're perceiving? Because uh, many, many practitioners who are working intuitively, which I think the largest segment from what I could tell, correct me if I'm wrong, in this realm are really energy healers, right? The various types as far as working with being able to assess intuitively, meaning that medical intuitives maybe, um, are, that term is, is growing. But what, what happens when a medical intuitive or an energy healer is assessing the energy, people often talk about blocks. So could you just, you know, walk us through when you're assessing somebody with your medical intuition, how you're doing that. And when somebody, for example, might have a history of trauma, which most people have, how you're able to detect that and how you see that connecting to the physical body and also to the mental body as well. Great question, Emmy. I appreciate that. So I'll give you the overview of how I do or what I do and, and what it looks like, because that's really the question is, what does this stuff look like, <laughs> right? Um, so I see energy in a couple of ways. Number one, because I'm using the visual sense, I want to get a good look at it, right? Uh, that really helps me understand what is going on and how I can explain that or impart that to the client. So I look at two things, three things, really. The first thing is the biofield, which is the auric field and the chakra system. We're going to look for imbalances, and they can look any way they look, right? One of my uh, tenets for how I teach and how I work is that I'm not going to put a label on what I see. I'm going to have a conversation with the biofield, with the body, with the energy systems, so that it can tell me what it is, rather than me saying, well, if it's a square, it's always this, or if it's a circle, it's always that, or if it's a this, it's always that. That doesn't work in this um, arena, because that is a biased perspective, right? If I think that this color always means that, then what would I miss in your energy if I see that color? Maybe it doesn't mean that, right? So this equals that is not part of my uh, work. It's not part of my training. We have to look and see what's there. So that's one way. The second way is to actually look at the anatomy of the body. So again, it looks very much like an anatomy book, right? I'm looking at the workings. It actually looks a bit like an MRI to me. And some medical intuitives see things that look like x-rays, right? Uh, and other kinds of visuals that are very valuable because they give us a good look at what's happening. Sometimes that information isn't literal. Sometimes it's representative. Like if I see a kidney that's dehydrated, maybe it looks like a little pruny shape, you know, but it's not definitely that in the body because then the body couldn't function. So we want to know how to interpret this information accurately. And that's part of the learning curve of this work. That's, those are the two ways I look at uh, the physical and the energetics of the body. The, the, the third way is the life history. This is where the origins of these issues manifested. One of the tenets of medical intuition is that the body holds information, uh, and it can hold it for decades, uh, that pertains to not only physical imbalance, but also emotional, mental, and spiritual imbalance. So we want to look for the origins of this. So that's like watching a little movie of your life, right? I'm going to ask the body to show me, the energy to show me where this began, what happened, why did it happen, and what did my client 
do with that information that could have caused an imbalance later, right? Very much like that concept of ACEs, early life uh, intensity, trauma, whatever, traumatic life events, things like that. What happened in the energy field that could have led to a later imbalance? And when you speak of energy, can you describe for those who might be new to that concept in the context of providing medical intuition, what you mean by that? Energy is a big, fluffy word. <laughs> uh, for me, it's very visual. So uh, when I look at a chakra, if it looks, you know, closed up, or uh, if it looks like it's impacted in some way, maybe it's shut down, or maybe it's dark, or maybe it's just, you know, waving its little hand at me going, hey, look at me, <laughs> or an organ of your body or a system of your body, it can really look like anything. And uh, one of the things that I talk about in my book is the whole idea of bias and how we have to remove it from this process. Uh, Western medicine is built on bias and for very good reason, because you need to have a framework for something and framework is a bias, right? Uh, but we don't want to have such a bias that we can't see anything beyond that. That's tunnel vision, right? That's one of the main issues, not only with Western medicine, but also complementary and alternative medicine. Everyone's a specialist, right? Medical intuitives are not specialists. We're, we're broad. We want to see the whole thing, right? We don't want to, and we can go in and see slices of things for sure. But what's really fascinating about teaching this work is teaching people from so many disciplines, uh, healthcare disciplines, doctors, nurses, of course, um, on and on, all the way to, you know, chiropractors, acupuncturists, and health coaches, right? Everybody comes to this from their per, their own specialty perspective. And what they're trained in with me is how to look beyond their borders and see whatever is going on there. And then, uh, then people can really find the healing that they're looking for. It's a very holistic approach. It is the holistic approach as far as I, people talk about whole person health, which is such a great word. Uh, it takes into account the mind, the body, the life experience, the environment, all those great things. Well, medical intuition is by nature holistic. It's by nature whole person, right? And how much do you think the adverse childhood experiences, so for example, somebody who was abused either physically or mentally or neglected, Maybe they had a parent who was absent or um, had their own substance use issues. H how much do you feel trauma impacts a person's mind, body, spirit, holistic health and wellness? I think 100%. <laughs> but trauma is a big word. And uh, it, is a, it is a psychology word, right? So it's not a word that we would use. We would use, uh, you know, impactful experiences in life, things that made an impact, things that, um, listen, as far as I, I'm concerned, I have yet to see anyone who's gotten out of childhood without any kind of impactful life experience, right? This life is full of this. And what's interesting about these is in psychology, they really deal with the major, major impacts, right? Right. A substance abuse, you know, sexual, emotional, psychological trauma is really the big stuff. And that big stuff is really important. I mean, that can, that changes lives, uh, you know, usually not for the better until someone has the wherewithal to start to work on that. But what I, and what I also see are these subtle traumas. I call them subtle traumas, where if as a child you spill the milk, right, or you break a toy or something like that happens and mother scolds and, you know, mothers always scold and children always break toys, right? You can't quite, you really can't avoid that. Even something as subtle as that can set up an energetic pattern about how we think about ourselves, right? And that, that, it doesn't seem like that would cause any kind of energetic imbalance, but it might. Yeah, and it could even originate in another lifetime. Well, there's that. <laughs> and that's really interesting to look at. Is that something that you are able to pick up on? Or do you just pick up on what you sense in the moment in the here and now? There's really not a lot of, um, we can really look at anything. We can look at past lives, Akashic records. We can look into the energy field, into the physical body. Uh, you know, that comprehensive look is what medical intuition does best. And that's how I teach it, is we want to see everything. Everything that's relevant for the client in the moment is what we want to see. Some people are familiar with Edgar Cayce 
And you do a beautiful job in your book of describing a little bit of the history of medical intuition, and including talking about Franz Anton Mesmer. <laughs> Could you just give us a little bit of a background about medical, how medical intuition came into its modern use today? Yes. You know, when I wrote the book, I wanted to find out where the origins of this was. And for most people, Edgar Casey's kind of the beginning, and he was from the 1900s through the 1950s. That was his time. Um, and of course, he started his center in Virginia Beach. It's still going. Uh, and of course, Carolyn Mays and Mona Lisa Schultz and Judith Orloff and some of the modern proponents of medical intuition. Uh, and they're wonderful, and their work is wonderful. But there is a history that most people don't know about. In uh, the late 1700s into the 1800s, really for almost 100 years, uh, mesmerism was a huge part of healthcare, believe it or not. Uh, definitely debated, definitely it was controversial. But uh, Franz Mesmer came up with um, a method of he, essentially energy healing techniques that uh, that were very popular with the public and they were they seemed to work and he was quite a genius in his time right so his students his people who studied with him uh, took this information and kind of expanded on it and these were physicians and scientists they weren't lay people at the time this is like the early to mid 1800s uh, what some of the physicians began to notice as they mesmerized their patients is that some of those patients could accurately diagnose their own issues and also uh, come up with remedies for their issues, right? Now, this was a time when the remedies that, you know, medical science had were often very, you know, challenging for the body, <laughs> Right. Uh, and they were finding um, remedies that actually could really work for them, you know, herbs and whatever else, you know, all kinds of. Could you just share what mesmerized is? OK, so mesmerism is an early form of what we now call hypnotism. So you, the the practitioner would put the patient into a trance state. Sorry about that. I didn't explain it. We we know we know that word. I was mesmerized by something. Right. That word comes from Franz Mesmer and his work. And these early energy techniques involve putting people in kind of a light trance state. So it's really interesting to look into that history. And I was fascinated to see that. Uh, clairvoyance and a lot of different intuitive skills were being utilized by mesmerized patients and they studied it and they actually um, in 1831 uh, the French Royal Academy decided that there was value here it was valid <laughs> finally people validated it and then it was all gone because by the time the 1900s rolled around uh, Western medicine was really looking, medicine was looking at the body as a more mechanistic type of um, reaction. In other words, you know, cause and effect kind of things in the physiology of the body. Yeah, the microscope invention, the bacteria, recognizing that hygiene, physical hygiene, washing hands is important and can help with health and the invention of penicillin. And so things got really microscopic and very reductionistic. Well, thank goodness for that. And, and it's unfortunate that we lost the whole idea of uh, this idea that the body actually has this, these other, uh, you know, energies about them. Uh, uh, Franz Mesmer called it uh, animal magnetism, believe it or not. We don't think about that word now. But what it was called later was vitalism. And people can look that up. Vitalism meant that the body had other um, energies in it that affected health. And of course, you know, that reaches back 5,000 years to uh, traditional Chinese medicine and Ayurvedic medicine. So he was onto something and trying to modernize it, uh, but it never really got too far, unfortunately. Qi and prana vital life force. And so that's essentially what uh, maybe you're picking up on when you are doing your medical intuitive assessments. Yes, but not in those very specific ways. Those specific ways really apply to traditional Chinese medicine, to Ayurvedic medicine, and they're very specific. There's meridian channels, there's all kinds of things uh, that you would work with, but it does have to do with the energy of the body and the energy systems of the body. Edgar Casey 
through reading your book, it sounds like he was quite accurate in helping with accurately assessing or diagnosing and finding remedies for his patients. You know, Edgar Casey's history is really fascinating. And his work at, with the medical intuitive side, he did a lot of different kinds of work. His work with the medical intuitive side was really, really unique. And actually, he opened a clinic. And in his clinic, um, they worked with the remedies that he intuited through his session. One of the things I found fascinating about his work is that he believed, after doing so many looks and readings with people, he believed that the gut that gut health was the cornerstone of health. So his clinic really mainly dealt with gut health. And we now what do we call that? The microbiome, right? We know so much about it, but he was doing this in, you know, 1930s, 1940s. Right. So he was able to pick up on aspects of the physical body that weren't able to be physically diagnosed at that time or evaluated. That's not unusual for medical intuitives. Uh, some of the trickiest things out there, uh, you know, it was for many years Lyme disease and chronic fatigue, and there's more science on that now. Uh, but now we have, you know, COVID and long COVID issues, and we have, the, believe me, there will be plenty. And there's a lot to look at that, um, uh, particularly gut health, uh, that Western medicine, you know, doesn't really have the tools for in many cases. Uh, in many cases, they do. So I'm actually a, f a big proponent of Western medicine testing. And I'm a big proponent of people having a good, solid relationship with their primary care provider. That is really important. We need to use all the tools we have, not just, you know, not only complementary and alternative medicine and not only Western medicine, but that's why integrative medicine, which combines the two, is so important. And uh, that's where medical intuition really uh, can support all of that. And I just want to add in that part of the history of your experience of being a medical intuitive is that when you were young, you received Zener cards or Zener cards <laughs> from Hella Hammond, who was a remote viewer with Russell Targ at SRI International. How, can you tell us how you received those? <laughs> Well, I was quite young, and uh, Hella Hammond was a dear friend of my mother and, and my parents, and she was a photographer uh, by trade, and she used to take pictures of our family. <laughs> so I knew her as a photographer and a friend of the family. She was kind of a, an aunt to me in many ways. And uh, one of my memories as I wrote the book, I was thinking back, you know, when did I have memories of actually being intuitive? <laughs> I want to go back through my history. And I recall that my sister and I used to play with a set of uh, Zener cards, which are uh, it's a big deck of cards, and it, it goes in uh, five, there's five different symbols, you know, a, a star, a wavy lines, a circle, a square, something else. And um, what you do is it's an ESP game, right? So one person looks at a card and kind of beams that symbol to the person across from them, and the person across from them receives that information, however they receive it, and then they say what they see. <laughs> <laughs> that experience was really valuable to me, although it was just a game, you know, it was a game that my sister and I like to play. So this is actually how one develops one's intuitive perception. Yeah, I believe J.B. Ryan used that in many of his studies to help legitimize parapsychology and these abilities. Yes, he did. Yes. How well accepted is medical intuition currently in, you and I are here in the U.S., in the current mainstream healthcare system? <laughs> not. <laughs> it is, it's not understood. Well, I'll tell you what is understood is a physician and nurse intuition. That is actually understood. Uh, doctors talk about gut feelings. Nurses talk about noticing when something seems off. And um, they are not trained to do this, but they know the value of it. So there's actually quite a bit of st a number of studies on intuition in healthcare and how doctors use it and how nurses use it and the value of it. So it's actually quite acknowledged. What isn't understood is that it can be honed and used as a skill in healthcare. That's what's not understood. So when I speak at integrative health conferences uh, to nurses and doctors, and when I teach, you know, at some of these wonderful places where I'm teaching fourth year medical students, you know, and, and practitioners, um, they're, they're kind of like, wow, how come we didn't learn about this in school? 
<laughs> and the answer is we're not there yet, but we're getting there. Um, I just recently did um, a video uh, presentation for uh, University of Colorado's Anschutz Medical Center, and I've done work with the AIHM, the Academy for Integrative Health and Medicine, and I've done work with the Andrew Weil Center for Integrative Medicine. So these are all places where um, traditionally trained Uh, medical professionals can learn more about this skill and the value of it in healthcare. Yeah, I've come across research studies where intuition is valued and many healthcare professionals mm, often privately share that they do use their intuition, but they are afraid that their colleagues are going to judge them that they're not being clinical enough. Um, But but many practitioners say that that is that is a big part of what they can rely on when they're in those intense moments needing to make sometimes life and death choices. Yes. And in the book, I was very privileged to interview a number of nurses and doctors on this very subject. And some of them were trained medical intuitives as well. So um, the stigma around intuition is which is vast. <laughs> and that's what we're really working to overcome. Uh, that goes across the board. The stigma about intuition is across the board in, in our culture, which is unfortunate uh, because of the value that intuition can bring not only in healthcare, but in every other part of life. But um, I'm working to try to overcome those stereotypes. Uh, you know, when you talk about intuition, people, especially in the healthcare world, they think about the street corner psychic, <laughs> you know, nothing, not that there's anything wrong with that, but that's not what we're doing here. So we need to make that distinction. And that's a big part of why I wrote the book is to help make the distinction of how this is valuable in healthcare, how it can be developed and optimized as a useful skill. Right. And recognize that many healthcare professionals are innately using their intuition by listening to their gut when they're making those choices or where they're trying to maybe make even a diagnosis. And I think about in your book, I believe you mentioned an ICU nurse who talked about how she listened to her intuition that helped her patients in critical moments. Yes, absolutely. Uh, she's wonderful. And she's one of many nurses who use their intuition, holistic nurses, uh, they have a they have an understanding of what this is, and they're very open to this. And the question for them is whether or not the their attending physicians will listen to them you know, when they have these intuitive understandings or hits or whatever you want to call it. Um, intuition is incredibly valuable. One of the most uh, interesting interviews I did in the book, which I'm so thrilled about, uh, was a doctor, a New York doctor, who is so open to this and so willing. She's an integrative healthcare physician. She actually works with directly with a medical intuitive in her, the exam room with the patient. Right? That is that is an absolutely new model that I hope most you know doctors listen to and understand because that is such a valuable skill. And um, she's been able, she and her medical intuitive. They knock ideas around, you know, he, he does his thing and she does her thing. And with the two of them, their knowledge base and their abilities uh, really have helped their patients find health and wellness and healing uh, that no other option has given them. And so I've interviewed also some of their, her patients and they talk about this combination of, you know, medically, Western medically trained integrative doctor along with medical intuitive and the just the the shifts that they've been able to achieve, the health they've been able to achieve with that team. And that's what, frankly, I'd really like to see. I'd really like to see not only medical doctors and nurses being trained in this skill that they can bring into hospitals and into their clinics, but also medical intuitives working alongside uh, doctors and, and as a part of the healthcare team. Because, you know, the value is, is really uh, quite astounding when you give it some thought. Just to clarify, medical intuition is an evaluative process, correct? It's not diagnosing the person or the patient. Well, the only people that can, you're correct, it's an assessment evaluation process. The only people that can legally diagnose are doctors, uh, medical doctors and people who are trained to diagnose and are licensed to diagnose. So, you know, uh, nurse practitioners and certain other licensed medical professionals. Uh, medical intuitives, unless they have that training and their board agrees that they can use this skill in that training, um, which is kind of rare at the moment. Hopefully that will change. Uh, medical intuitives are, are looking or viewing 
uh, the way I the way I work, the way I teach, and we're assessing what we see, and we're giving that information in terms of the visuals of what we're seeing to the client for them to take to their doctors so that their doctors can uh, use that in their diagnostic process. Right. So a medical intuitive who's not a licensed physician or uh, one who's able to prescribe or diagnose then can take that, share that information with their client, the patient, and they can bring that information to their primary care practitioner. However, if they are a licensed practitioner who is able to make diagnoses, they are then able to maybe enhance, well, definitely enhance their practice with medical intuition. Yes, and I will say that uh, right now in history, <laughs> we're not yet at the point where the medical boards will agree that this is a, a you know a skill that a doctor can use. Uh, so uh, we have to they have to be careful about that. So there are some ethical and you know legal requirements that they need to know. However, doctors have been using their intuition for however long, you know, forever, and so have nurses. So. You know, this is not within my wheelhouse. My wheelhouse is training people in this skill so that they can use it how it works best for them. And because I train people from a wide range of uh, disciplines, uh, they're going to figure out how they can use it. And so far, so good, you know. That's fascinating because here in the United States, energy healing, to my knowledge, in all of the U.S. states, there is not a even a certification required to be an energy healer. Although I believe you do have to have, I think what's recalled safe, what's called safe harbor laws in order to be able to practice using uh, integrative health approaches. Well, safe harbor, this is a bigger conversation and not really my wheelhouse, but I will say safe harbor laws, I think are only in nine states in the United States. And those are uh, laws that state that complementary and alternative practitioners and holistic healing arts practitioners can practice. It doesn't talk about the legal requirements in your state or even in your 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 locality, right? So um, the the thing I will say here about ethics and and the legal aspects of it is I cover that a little bit in the book, but I also give resources in the book for people to learn more. It's incredibly important for people to understand uh, the ethics of doing any kind of energy-based work and the legal um, requirements around that. Let's talk about the elephant in the room. <laughs> you mentioned in your book that mm, misdiagnoses, a person being misdiagnosed or not diagnosed correctly at all, is the third leading cause of death next to heart disease and cancer. And correct me if these stats don't seem accurate, but I, I think I read, maybe it was in your book or elsewhere, that most physicians are diagnosing practitioners are somewhere around 80 plus percent correct. Um, but they can miss, they can miss certain, uh, such as in the case of Annie and not, not always a fault of their own necessarily, right? We don't want, we, we love our physicians and nurse practitioners. This isn't to, to say that they're not doing a valuable job, but, but things can be missed. Absolutely, uh, things can be missed. What role does medical intuition play to be able to increase that percentage? Because you yourself have even conducted research that shows that you can get into the 90 plus even 100% diagnosis rate with using medical intuition, although it is a preliminary study. So medical providers talk about, you know, 80 plus accuracy rates. And Dr. Sheely wrote about that in his book years ago when he worked with Carolyn Mays. That's where he gauged his accuracy level. And I've heard that from other physicians. Um, the issue with the, the causes of death in the U.S., uh, med medical error has been number three on the list for many, many years only shifted in the last couple of years by COVID, which is now the number three spot, uh, but that will change again. And medical error means uh, misdiagnosis, missed diagnoses, um, issues with, you know, medications and treatments and over-treatment, under-treatment, things like that. Uh, there's a lot of aspects to it. Where medical intuition uh, comes in is that we have noticed anecdotally for many, many years uh, high accuracy rates. So what does that mean, right? What is high accuracy? Well, we really had, have had our um, anecdotal stories 
uh, happy clients. And a few, only a really a small handful of studies done on this very specific skill of medical intuition called many things over the years. So, when I looked at the research, I wanted to see where it was, what had been done, and was there any effectiveness, you know, could anyone gauge the effectiveness of it? And it's been very spotty. Some some studies showed very interesting results, and some studies showed absolutely no results. So, I train people in this skill, and I know that they come out of the program with this high level of accuracy because of the case reports and all the information, the data that we gather. So I wanted to see how accurate they were, right? So with some colleagues and friends of mine from University of California, San Diego, uh, we put together a survey study. It's called an exploratory uh, study, qualitative study, where we had five of my graduates who were completed the program and 67 uh, self-selected volunteers from the community. And some of these people were from the UCSD medical clinics, uh, patients, and some were from Scripps uh, Health Clinics, and some were just people who were interested in this idea. And we had them do uh, a half an hour to an hour session with one of the medical intuitives. Now, we did this as blinded as we could, meaning we don't do any intake. We never do anyway, uh, the way we work. And that practitioners, the medical intuitive's eyes were closed because that's how we work. We want to be able to see, so we use mind's eye type of clairvoyance. And so we, we did that. And also, there was not a lot of dialogue. We don't like to dialogue with our clients. We just want to see what's there and impart the information. So we used our protocols. And uh, afterwards, the participants filled out a survey and they said, you know, how close did they get? How accurate were they? What did you think of this? We asked a lot of questions. And here's what we found. We found that uh, the participants rated the medical intuitives as 94% accurate in the evaluation and location of their primary health issue. That was great to see. We didn't expect these high numbers. Yes, it's, it was wonderful to see that. Now, that was a subjective evaluation, but 67 people, you know, came out with that number. We were thrilled with that. We also saw uh, that 98, they, they evaluated the medical intuitives as 98% accurate in life history. Remember, we talked about where did this thing come from? Life history that was possible or probable in terms of their health issue which was a great outcome. That was lovely to see that we had such a high uh, accuracy rate there. One of the pieces of data that we were very interested in was uh, those participants who had had a diagnosis from their doctors, a known diagnosis. And we asked, how consistent was the medical intuitive with that diagnosis? That was about half of the participants had a known diagnosis. And they rated the medical intuitives as 94% consistent with their known medical diagnosis. That's a big number. I mean, that is, that, that, that's raised, waved all the flags, you know. And the uh, medical community was very interested in this because that's a validation of the skill of medical intuition with a known, that's a bit of a more of a gold standard look, you know, can the medical intuitive see the same thing that a gold standard test could see? That's called a validation study. We're actually working with a wonderful research organization to take this data and expand it and to see, to see if we can work with doctors and their medical records with their patients so that we can get more accuracy rates there. Beautiful. Yes. And you even had some hundred percent uh, scores as well. <laughs> we did. And that, that study was actually written up and um, uh, published in the Journal of Alternative and Complementary Medicine, which is a phenomenal peer-reviewed journal. And they were interested in this work, and people are interested in this work. When you look back in the book, I, I, I pulled out every uh, study on medical intuition I could find, that, and even some that aren't published completely, <laughs> uh, some new stuff in there that people haven't seen before, um, to see what, what physicians say about this, what researchers say about this, and everyone over and over, whether the test or the, the study was conclusive or inconclusive, everyone said, wouldn't this be great if we could validate it? Wouldn't it change the game if we could validate this? And that's where I'm coming from here with my program and with my students and, you know, the graduates. That's what they're bringing to their careers, to their practices. Can we validate this? How does this help? How can it 
move medicine forward? How can it shift this, frankly, broken paradigm of healthcare for patients and for doctors? Everyone seems to be suffering, you know? Uh, nurses and, and doctors are burning out like crazy, and it's not only COVID. This was happening well before. So what's working and what's not working? How can medical intuition help? Yes, I'm, I'm seeing many practitioners, uh, particularly occupational therapists who are reaching out to me, um, who are looking for other ways to be with themselves, but also serve their clients. And many of them are very uh, fascinated and interested in and are getting trained in energy healing and developing their intuition and recognize that there's more, there are more ways that we can serve people and that some things, again, there are many wonderful things happening in healthcare, um, but there are more ways that we can assist individuals than we are currently able to. And also, you know, the other elephant in the room is how much mainstream healthcare here in the U.S. is primarily a business. I mean, it's certainly there to help people, but when you have money mixed in, with people uh, being well and and not being well and different agendas, shall we say, on how well a person really gets when there can be money made on people not being well, you really have tension in a system. Yeah, you know, I, that's such a big topic, Emmy, and I'm with you all the way. I think it's a broken system in many ways. I'm not an expert on all that, but I certainly get an earful from my students who are dealing with this every day in their practices, and I feel for them. It's a challenging time, but it's also a changing time. And what is very exciting about this time, to put an accent on the positive, is integrative medicine, functional medicine, the uh, National Institutes of Health, uh, having a complete division for integrative health. That's huge. I mean, that's a big shift, right? And the reason for that shift, in my opinion, is because uh, mind-body medicine has become so permeated into culture. And what does that mean, mind-body medicine? It means mind-body practices, yoga, meditation, mindfulness training. These things are being taught in schools, you know, in, in elementary schools. <laughs> uh, things like that are really part of our culture now. And that was a long time coming. Um, that, you know, maybe it's 50 years or so of uh, these kinds of ideas starting to really filter in. And they've stayed and they've grown because they work. And because people really see the value. And that's what drives healthcare is the grassroots, you know, the, the, the population, the folks going, you know what? I meditated this morning and I feel great. And the symptom that I've had is now starting to, you know, shift and change. And I've used my intuition to look into my own body and converse with my own body. And I think this is what's going on. And then we can get the testing and then we can do all this stuff. So it's important for us on that macro level of healthcare, but it's also important for us on that micro level of me and my body, right? What does my body want? What is it asking for? So I want, my mission <laughs> is to assist both healthcare providers and individuals in uh, developing that conversation so that there's the, the mystery of it starts to lessen, right? So that we can really get to where we need to go with our health and understand how our minds affect our bodies, how our bodies can affect our minds, how all of our systems are integrated, you know, everything's attached to everything else. We're not just this series of cookie cutter pieces and parts, right? Yeah, many healthcare practitioners are experiencing or have been experiencing burnout. I've also recently heard a term called moral injury. So rather than putting the blame or some, some people might call it the victim blaming or victim shaming on the healthcare practitioner for burning out, uh, many are kind of reclaiming it with the term moral injury, meaning that the way that they want to or were thought that they could or wanted to originally practice can be difficult. And sometimes their hands feel tied in those mainstream healthcare settings. So so you're right, there's been a huge um, upswell of people like you and I and other practitioners who are expanding, and it's been going on for decades, really. And the research has really grown to uh, to validate the efficacy of many of these approaches. There's been even meta-analysis studies on Reiki that show that it can help with anxiety, depression, insomnia, nausea, uh, symptoms of, of trauma, and physical pain, and, and more. And of course, there's so many research studies now on yoga as well. And more healthcare practitioners 
are wanting to work holistically and they do want to be on the preventative side of healthcare because we now know a stat from the World Health Organization is that 80% of chronic health conditions can be prevented by lifestyle choices. And I even, uh, Deepak Chopra even mentioned with his institute and his research along with others is that, um, including Wayne Jonas, that uh, they're showing that even 93% or more of our health and wellness is really up to us, meaning our habits and routines, our mindset, our um, choices or lack thereof of that we make in life. And so I really applaud you for what you're doing uh, with medical intuition because I can see in the way you're describing it is that you are not only teaching healthcare practitioners, but could you share a little bit about, you mentioned that you also teach people how to uh, develop their own intuition for their own health and wellness as well. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I love, I love everything you just said. I'm, I'm right there with you. <laughs> um, the, I teach two, uh, several programs. The main program is uh, the medical intuitive training, and that is for wellness professionals, and that's a one-year program on medical intuition. And I just want to point out that our graduates of that program were the ones getting those 94 to 98% accuracy rates out of the box. Um, the other program I teach is a workshop, and that's for everyone. And uh, it's a way for you to learn how to dialogue with your body, to open up that conversation so that you can get direct information for what your body is asking for. And that's a wonderful workshop. I, I love teaching it. Some people might be thinking now, well, some people are just naturally gifted intuitives, and that's why they're getting these high accuracy rates. Or maybe there's some flaw in the study that <laughs> wasn't <laughs> accounted for, although I've looked at your study and I can see that you, um, from what I could tell, were as careful as you could be. Uh, what do you say about different people's abilities who are trained as medical intuitives, or do you feel that the way that you're teaching it really can ensure those high percentage rates? Okay, so the idea that uh, whether or not someone is gifted is a false idea in that everyone has the ability to develop their intuition. We're all born with this. Uh, we all have intuition. Some of us choose to develop it, some don't, and that's perfectly fine. In my program, it's a very structured, methodical practice of medical intuition that goes from, you know, all the way from the beginning with people who are quite skeptical, who say they never had an intuitive bone in their body, <laughs> to uh, the end of the program where they are reading accurately for their clients. And that is a trajectory that it, it takes time to learn. There's a learning curve in it. The learning curve is about uh, uh, learning how to use these intuitive skills without our logical brain going off constantly, right? So it, it is a learning curve, but I have to tell you, I've had, you know, very high success rates here. Uh, the students love it. And uh, really anyone can learn how to develop this. Well, well done, Wendy. How much of a role do you feel that love plays in our health and wellness, having deeply and intimately looked into people's energy, soul, bodies? Is that something that kind of rises to the surface at all in the work that you do? Oh, what a good question. Um, I would say that the most critical aspect of health when it comes to the energy of love is whether or not we are loving ourselves. Uh, self-love, self-support, good self-talk, all of those things seem to be challenging for everyone, <laughs> um, you know, for a number of reasons. But our bodies are very much like little children, right? They, When they're hurting, when they're in pain, when they're out of balance, they... They need our love. They need our support. They need us to pay attention, just like a little kid does. And so that's the way I work with people's bodies is, what is it you want? What is it you're asking for? What's out of balance here? Let's take a look at it from that loving perspective of giving the body what it really, really wants to uh, achieve, you know, as, as vibrant health as it can possibly achieve. And that's something we don't generally think about in life, right? We inhabit our bodies, we use them, we enjoy them, or we do stuff with them, but we don't, we don't really think about them as something that has its own consciousness. And so that's where I come from with this. Our bodies have a lot of consciousness. They have a lot to say. Are there any last thoughts you have that you want to share with our audience? Well, people often ask me, how do I develop this? And my first 
answer to that is start with a meditation practice. Start with a practice where you go inward and quiet the mind and quiet the vagus nerve, you know, the, our, quiet our bodies, and just be with our bodies and just listen and be present for whatever our body has to say. That is a very, very critical skill. It's a basic skill in learning how to really become an advocate for our own health. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. And thank you so much for all of the pioneering work that you're doing, Wendy, and the ways that you are helping heal our healthcare system and are helping heal so many individuals. Thank you so much for being with me. Thank you, Emmy. It's been an absolute pleasure. And for those of you listening or watching, thank you for being with us. Thank you.